Okay, so um, we'll get started, and if anybody else joins, obviously we'll let them in um, as, as as we go as we go along. Um, but lovely to see you all. A huge welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. I um, hope you enjoy the evening. So my name's Karen. Um, I'm from Fascinating Fens. Um, so the, yeah, this evening um, is part of our Fen Folks Friday. I've seen some of your faces before, so I know that you've been to these sessions before. Some of you are new, so welcome to, to all of you really. For those who might not have been before, um, we do this once a month um, via Zoom. Um, and it's just a really great chance to try to bring people together who might have similar um, love of the fens and who might want to find out more about it and to meet other people um, who might enjoy the fens as well. Um, so we've been doing it for quite a few few months now. Um, this year we've um, received a small grant from Healthy Fens and so we do thank them for that um, to pay for, for the Zoom for this year. So that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, there's lots of different topics that we have. So sometimes it's more about history, sometimes it's more creative stuff, um, a really real variety. Sometimes it's more about nature, so real variety. Um, if you haven't come across Fascinating Friends much before, so I'm on um, Facebook, we're on Twitter, there's a website. So if you're not already familiar with those, please do have a little bit of a look because we're looking at different things to do with friends from that point of view. The idea of Fascinating Fens is literally to try to bring people together to explore the Fens through heritage and creativity and, and nature and, and well-being as well. Um, also, a little bit later, we'll, I'll be talking about what's sort of coming up in the Fens and we'll be plugging Celebrate the Fens Day, which is um, a month, well, a full weeks actually, to, tomorrow. Um, so it's coming up quite quickly now, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but also at that time after the break, we'll also give you a chance if you've got, if you know of any events or things that are coming up around the fence, if you want to give a plug, then please feel free um, just after the break time. So um, we'll, I'll do a little bit of an intro for Zoom as well in a moment, then we'll have our talk, then we'll have a break time. Um, then any opportunities for, for, for questions for our speaker tonight, um, and then talking about what's coming up in the fence, but then I tend to leave the um, the room opened us for a little while in case anybody wants to have a little bit of a, a natter, then you're very welcome to um, as well, because I think that's a, a nice part that you can have a sort of a, a little bit of a natter and, and get to meet each other and things too. And so over to you, Bob. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks a lot, Karen. Cheers. Um, let me just get the screen up. Um, I hope you are all seeing a screen that says Fenland Archaeology, Digging the Fens, Bob Smith. Um, that's me. Let me give you a brief background about myself. Um, my parents moved up to the Fens in the mid-80s from London. Um, I moved up here permanently in 2011 but my daughter went to school around here and is currently a teacher in Peterborough. So I've been in the Fens for quite a long time, mainly around the Wisbeach area, but I'm a very keen cyclist, so I do get around a bit. Um, I don't work, I don't do paid work anymore, so I'm able to follow interests. Um, my first degree, way back in the 70s was in history and politics i've taken or i've gained two master's degrees since then uh, one of them in the history and archaeology of the highlands and islands uh, with particular reference to orkney uh, which i spend time in every year both researching history and actively involved in archaeology. I'm a life member of the Orkney Archaeological uh, Society. So uh, history and archaeology have both got an equal place in my heart. Um, from a history point of view, I've got a, a real interest in naval history. I'm a member of the Society of Nautical Research. And I think I saw a name on the screen that I recognise, who is one of the esteemed fellows of the Society of Nautical Research, which is the oldest nautical research society in the world. Um, we have members all over the world. So very interested in naval history. But I've started research for a doctorate 
which is, takes us back to the Fens, but with a Scottish flavour, because I'm looking into the plight of the Scottish prisoners who were taken at Dunbar and Worcester in 1650 and forced to dig the, the new river, new rivers, new cuts, new dikes all over the Fens. Uh, people say there's a lot known about it. Some of the history out there is very dodgy. So I'm trying to go back to primary sources and hopefully can come back in a couple of years time and tell you with a great deal more um, certainty what happened to some of these Scots prisoners. That brings me to an important thing about tonight. I, I recognize some of the faces. I recognize some of the names here tonight. And some of you have forgotten more about the Fens than I'll probably ever learn. One of the problems about being a historian and getting more and more expert is that your focus gets narrower and narrower and narrower. So all of a sudden you can talk with a great deal of knowledge about one particular thing. And then somebody throws in a question about something that happened 50 miles down the road the year before and you haven't got a clue what they're talking about and it is one of the problems of specialization um, so my knowledge about fenland archaeology is pretty much concentrated around wisbeach wisbeach st mary but obviously i've looked in other places and visited other places as well but I will be quoting him later, but up front, if any of you want a really good readable book about archaeology and the Fens, go out and buy Francis Pryor's book, The Fens. It really is that simple. Wonderful book. Many of you I know know Francis Pryor. He's as good a writer as he is a raconteur, and he covers all the different aspects of archaeology. Archaeology, of course, I suppose, is still relatively new. Um, if you look at this timeline I'm putting up, it shows you the sort of period that we're looking at. Now, when it says the Stone Age, I, th I think this is, this is designed for the classroom for youngsters. And in the Fens, you're not going to find too much before what we call the Neolithic, which is the new Stone Age which starts round about 3800 BC. There is, however, some Mesolithic stuff. That's the middle period of the Stone Age. And that's a very important period, particularly when you go out onto the coast and realize that what you're looking at used to be land. And it used to be land that stretched all the way over to Holland and people lived there. And then as the Ice Age, the last big Ice Age, started coming to an end, there was a huge inundation and little by little that land was lost until you were left with Dogger Bank and then Dogger Bank was covered up. But for the last hundred years, things have been found. And in the last 30 or 40 years, a great deal has been found. And we're starting to learn about the Mesolithic people who lived there so what's the difference between the middle stone age and that later stone age the neolithic and the biggest difference is that the neolithic sees the introduction of farming of settlements and it also is the age of the big monuments the, the, the most obvious being stonehenge or if you go up to orkney the ring of brodga they've discovered so much up in Orkney. I could talk about that for three days and, and not dry up. But then we move into the Bronze Age, which speaks for itself, not a particularly long period when you look at it. The Iron Age, the Celts, uh, an even shorter period, but it overlaps with the Romans. And the heading there, prehistory, again, very misleading because prehistory usually means before things were written down. Um, depends where you are in the country. If you're up in Orkney, prehistory probably goes on a little bit longer than it does 
say in Northumberland. So these dates are very, very basic. The Romans leaving in 410 and then the Saxons. That's far too easy. Yes, we know a lot of Romans left in 410, but a lot stayed or a lot of people who were part of the Roman Empire stayed. Because let's be very clear about this. A lot of the people who we think of as Romans weren't from Italy. They weren't from Rome. They were from Germany and France and other places like that. In fact, most of the legions up on Hadrian's Wall, a, a lot of them were Germanic, possibly because they were able to cope with the climate more. And then the Saxons come along. So this is a huge period of time. And in the Fens, I suppose our real um, archaeology starts in the Bronze Age. There is some Neolithic stuff. There is a enclosed causeway, um, a causeway enclosure at Etton, which Francis Pryor was the one who did the dig there. And I think that's back in the 80s. One of the lovely things about modern technology is where we used to have to pay a fortune for some of these reports. You can now go online and download them. Um, I downloaded the Etten one. Solutions far too much for me to take in, but I was able to steal from it for an essay I was doing. Um, Technology is good, but technology can also be a bit of a pain. So health warning, I'm using a MacBook tonight. I've never used a MacBook and presented before. Uh, one of the reasons I got a MacBook was because I was fed up with all the upgrades and that that Windows would keep doing and Macs were more stable. While you were all talking earlier, my MacBook tried to force an update on me which I've managed to put off until the early hours of the morning. So I'm hoping it's not going to fall over. If it does, talk amongst yourselves. Give me five minutes or so. Um, if we go on from the Neolithic, though, and we look at the Bronze Age, I'm going to talk about something quite significant about the Bronze Age later on. But you'll all be aware of Flag Fen out at um, Peterborough. Peterborough Whittlesea, which is a remarkable site, another Francis Pryor site. Um, so I'm going to park the Bronze Age for now. I'm going to park the Iron Age in a way. But everybody talks about Boudicca. A lot of us, when we went to school, it was Bodicea. I don't care what you call her. What I'm telling you is that we know very little about her. Um, books have been written about her. They're rubbish. They're based on supposition. There's hardly any archaeology at all that tells us about her and about the Iceni. We probably know a little bit more. We're learning a little bit more. Uh, Susan Oosterhausen, Professor Oosterhausen, who's written about the Anglo-Saxons and that, uh, wrote a small book called uh, The Emerging English, I think it's called. And one of the things that comes out of there is that the Iceni probably, that they, they were a Celtic, Celtic tribe, as you know, probably spoke a language closer to Welsh than to the Celtic languages of the north and of Ireland. Um, so I can't demonstrate this in a slide, but if you can see my hands, when tribes come over from Europe, they come in two directions. One's ends up uh, Ireland and Northern Britain, and one's en ends up in Southern Britain. But even now, there are arguments amongst archaeologists about um, who arrived when, were the Neolithic people wiped out and replaced by what we call the Beaker people. Those arguments are going to go on for quite a while. I will talk about it a bit later, though, because the science that's available to us now is making us understand a lot more. But why am I starting with the Romans? Because really that's when prehistory ends. The Romans start writing things down. 
What we know about Boudicca was largely written by Tacitus. Um, take a lot of it with a pinch of salt because he was writing for his, uh, he wasn't going to give bad news or too much bad news to the people he was writing for. Um, and if the Romans were beaten at any stage, he was also always going to make the people who beat them perhaps look a lot bigger and better than they were. The, uh, the final battle um, where Boudicca falls, the site of that has never been found. If anybody does find it, who knows what it might turn up. But what happens in the Fens when the Romans invade in AD 43? Well, I can put my hand on my heart and tell you that by AD 44, very little. The people of the Fens would have carried on the way they are at the moment. Bearing in mind the wash was all the way up to where I am in Wisbeach, and the, the landscape looked a lot different. Uh, one of the members of Fenland archaeology is Bill Smith, um, expert on the Upwell tram well worth buying his books to read but bill was also a bit of an expert on the old river systems uh, where they flowed what they were called what they did and it's it's absolutely fascinating how much the rivers have changed so when the romans started coming into what we call the fens it was a very different landscape um, i mean quite obviously there weren't the buildings but there were there was some development at Stony, for instance, there was almost certainly an Iceni camp there that the Romans take over, they fortify, they build a tower, and there is an archaeological group in that area who are doing some really interesting, important work uh, developing that site. But that site has been dug to death. I, I, I doubt there's very little left to find except when we start talking about what new technology might find. So initially, not a lot changes, but, and I've put that up as a joke, clearly the native British did not all start wearing togas, and, and nor did they. Um, but what happens with any invasion? The invaders adapt, they have to. They have to get locals on their side. They're not there certainly they wouldn't be visiting the fens for the weather would they not at the moment they're here to exploit resources one of those big resources was salt of course and they needed to use local knowledge to exploit local resources always been a good farming area so let's exploit the farming they had to ship stuff back to rome if they didn't Rome would be saying, why are you there? We're committing all these troops. You're building all these wonderful things, but why? We're not getting anything out of it. So as a whole, in Britain, the Romans were getting good stuff, tin, zinc, foodstuffs, salt, all going back to Rome. And in fact, um, I read something the other day where somebody was saying, oh, if only the Romans were here, we'd have good roads in the fens again. Well, jokes aside, everybody says all oh, the Romans built in straight lines. Not always. But when they built in this country, they were actually building on tracks that the, the native British had already developed. They improved the surfaces. They had to because of the huge amounts of uh, traffic those roads were going to take. But the actual direction of those roads was largely in place. And where Peterborough is now, and of course, just outside Peterborough, Castor, became an important pivot point for Roman Britain. It was the gateway to the north or south, depending which way you were going. And the building at Castor, which no longer exists, although there is some wall left there, was um, somebody's going to correct me later if I get this wrong, because I know there's a caster expert listening tonight. But I think it was the biggest building in the Roman Empire outside of Rome, the Presidium. Huge building. Uh, a lot of that site is now taken up with the local church, and it's quite high up. So it looks down around the surrounding countryside. 
we don't really know what the Presidium looked like. Um, we got a fair idea, but it, it was huge. Romans wouldn't build something like that unless they were really getting something out of the land and they were really exploiting local resources. Um, so did much change in the fens? Well, we think it did. Archaeologically, we are finding more and more Roman uh, evidence of a Roman presence and not just uh, a cheap Roman presence. If you go in Wisbeach Museum, you will see some marvellous examples of Roman pottery, something called Samian ware. I'm going to show you a remarkable picture of a piece that we found. Um, finding a piece of Samian ware doesn't mean it was a high status property, but finding a lot of it means ooh, possibly there was something going on there because this stuff was made over on mainland Europe and had to be exported to Britain. Um, so the big change is that yes, farming went on, livestock farming, crop farming, but the Romans organized it better so they could take a bigger cut. Let me just tell you about Fenland archeology span where a, a community organization of just over 40 members. We started 11 years ago following a professional archeological dig at the property called Wisbeach Castle. Uh, as most of you know, it's not a castle and it hasn't been a castle for 800 years. Locally, people still call it Wisbeach Castle and there's a sign outside that says Wisbeach Castle. It is not a castle. And in fact, that archeological dig was a very serious professional one. Again, the report of that is available for nothing. You can download it. Uh, couldn't find any remnants of the original castle at all. Um, when the castle went, the Bishop's Palace went on there, that went and a, a Regency mansion went on there. And now you've got the current uh, Georgian house on there. Still a lovely place, remarkable place and well worth preserving. Uh, and that's where Fenland archeology span cut its teeth. And after that, uh, Andy Ketley, uh, who whilst he might not have my qualifications, has forgotten more about Roman pottery and glass than I'll ever learn, uh, set up Fenland Archaeology. He's our current president and still very active and into his 70s now, uh, still gets down in the trenches and digs with the best of us. Um, so what do we do? Um, well, obviously we carry out excavations. We do field walking which is a very pleasant uh, activity where we go to a new field and very in a very organized way, walk across it, picking up bits that the farmer's plow has brought up. If um, there's enough, uh, we draw something called a scattered di uh, diagram, which will tell us maybe in that 10 meter square, it might be worth putting a trench. But before we do that, we do a bit of geophys work. So we look under the ground, using magnetic resistance, uh, and then we'll dig a trench or two. We do outreach work with the schools. Um, more and more we find that history, our history, the history of the Fens is not being taught in schools. There's not even much taught about the Romans these days. Uh, and we do assist with some community projects as well. This is two of our members at a community dig we did in the gardens of Wisbeach Museum as part of a heritage lottery fund uh, project. Um, a couple of us were skeptical about it and we were right to be so because all that lovely earth you see being dug up there was actually dumped there in the 60s and with it uh, a lot of pottery sherds were brought. So we never actually got down to any sort of level where the original um, contents of the earth would be. So what happens? Farmers get a lot of rubbish, put it in their gateways, so they've got traction as they go through the gateways. Some of them get scooped up, dumped elsewhere. You've got to be very careful what you're looking at. And if we pick something up 
out of context, you're immediately suspicious. And one of the things we actually found when we were digging in the museum was a little scoop. And that scoop would originally have been on a, on a little ring. And the scoop was used in Roman times and later on for getting wax out of your ear. Well, where did that come from? We think somebody must have been sorting something out in the museum and accidentally dropped it in the garden maybe 10 years before. It's the only explanation, but we can't age it because we just don't have any context. Um, the membership we've got, wide range of skills, professional archeologists, teachers, IT experts, historian, many others. Um, and it's a really good group. Um, some very enthusiastic people who turn out in all weathers. Um, this was good weather, and this was us uh, doing some geophys. So this chap here, this is the device that actually is sending a current into the ground and then coming back on the top of it there. If you can see that is a, is a reader that then gets downloaded to a computer and that gives us a picture of what's under the ground on the area that we're doing the geophys on. We're very lucky, we don't own this equipment, it's quite expensive. There is an overarching group called Jigsaw started by a professional archeologist in Oxford East. And even though the heritage lottery funding dried up three or four years ago, as a professional body who rely on, you know, commercial archaeology, they still fund uh, um, Jigsaw. So local archaeology groups like ourselves, uh, FenEdge, a couple of others, some local history groups get together once every month or so as a jigsaw group talk about what we're doing where we can help one another good ideas and all the rest of it and oxford east have got this equipment and they loan it out to us as local groups so we can't have it all year round we got it we booked it out and we were very lucky with the weather this is a big field at whiz beach st mary that we're looking at which we've found some quite remarkable stuff under um, what we do in the fens, we think is important, but we can't act in isolation. Um, however expert some of us are, you always need a more expert opinion on particular things, and that costs money. If I can give you one example, we found uh, at Wisbeach St Mary a piece of blue glass, and Andy Ketley, who I've mentioned, immediately said, that's Roman. And we contacted somebody at Cambridge University, no less, who said very pompously, it can't possibly be no Roman glass has been found in the fence. So we scratched their heads about that a little bit. And you'll all know Carenza Lewis, who was on Time Team. And uh, here's a tip, Time Team is coming back. She's coming back on Time Team, but it will be on a YouTube channel. Um, we were mentioning this to Carenza, uh, who's now Professor of Public Engagement at Lincoln University. And she was just shocked that an academic would say that to us. And I agree. We went and got another opinion, which we paid for out of our own money. Uh, didn't ask any leading questions. And a renowned expert on Roman glass said, well done. First piece of Roman glass that I know of that's been found in the fens. Definitely Roman. But we had to have a whip round to pay for that. And we can't do that every time. We do rely on others. Um, when it comes to finding sites, we rely on friendly farmers and local knowledge, plus a lot of inquisitiveness. Now, this, there's two or three fields we, we dig on in Wisbeach St Mary, simply because over the last 40 years, the farmer who's dug, uh, who, who owns the fields has brought up a lot of pottery with his plough. And as he approached retirement, he built a big shed, laid it all out and asked Andy and a couple of others to go and look at it. 
then got chatting to them and he decided he wanted to find out more about his fields. And that's what for the last six or seven years we've been doing. And God bless him. Um, he is, well, he's a star. The outreach work we do with schools has ground to a halt uh, for obvious reasons. But this is some of the kit that we've bought. Um, a Roman shield that's child size, helmets that are child size. Um, down here is a wax tablet that you can write in as the Romans would have, a chain mail. Uh, yes, the Romans did wear chain mail. There is a, a gladius, a Roman short sword. Um, we don't let the kids uh, wave that around too much, but they're absolutely fascinated to see and touch this very real stuff. The other thing they really like is this uh, in the middle there is a, a pair of uh, replica Roman sandals and it doesn't show in this picture, but when you turn them over, they're soldier sandals because they're hobnailed. And anybody who's ever worn army boots, the old army boots, not the modern stuff, will know what hobnails look like. And these look just the same 2000 years ago. Hobnails were in then and they were in right the way up until about 1950. Um, Archaeology needs funding, uh, various sources. Heritage Lottery Fund were very generous in our early years. Um, developers, you can't build a housing estate these days without getting the archaeologists in. And if you're the developer, you've got to pay for it. We're back in the Bronze Age now. This is Must Farm. Um, I took this photograph. Uh, it's the only photograph I'm going to show because it is, for me, the most remarkable. For those of you who don't know about Must Farm, it's Whittlesea more than Peterborough. About a mile, mile and a half as the crow flies from Flag Fen. And it was discovered. Um, because the factory owners there of the, the brick and the quarry wanted to extend. And therefore, they had to get archaeologists in. I think the media sometimes paints people like that and developers as the enemy. I've got to tell you, the developers at Must Farm are stars, absolute stars. They gave the team from Cambridge a year and ended up giving them a heck of a lot more. And we went over there as Fenland Archaeology on a very cold February morning. And those of you who know about archaeology know that you don't normally dig in February. The reason they could dig at Must Farm is because they had built a hangar like building about 100 metres long 50 meters wide 30 meters high uh, steel and aluminium structure with uh, reinforced plastic panels so they could work all the year round without the site getting soaking wet so what is the site or what was the site because it's covered up now they discovered that at some time towards the end of the bronze age um, there were a number of houses, I think it's nine, it might be 11, that were built on stilts above a waterway, above a watercourse. And one day, there is a huge fire, and this fire tears through the whole settlement, and it all falls inwards, goes into the watercourse, sinks down into the mud and muck at the bottom, and is preserved. So here we are 3000 years later, finding one of the best preserved Bronze Age sites ever. And for those of you who have been to Flag Fen, you'll know that Francis's work, Francis Pryor's work at Flag Fen turned up a lot of interesting stuff. And in the museum at Flag Fen, they have a replica wooden wheel, wooden cartwheel, because they found part of one. In this photograph, what you're looking at, and we were there the day they finished um, unearthing it, is the first complete 
Bronze Age wooden wheel ever found in this country. It is a most remarkable find. But of course, the Must Farm team then go on to find a whole load of other things that are just simply mind boggling. Uh, pots of food, where not only is the pot intact, but the food residue is at the bottom and preserved. So they're able to run analysis of the food and tell us about the diet. They have found objects that show that 3,000 plus years ago, our ancestors were trading with mainland Europe. They found um, the must farm boats, hollowed out boats, which were probably, well, almost certainly not good enough to cross the sea, but good enough to go up and down the, the waterways. And if you think in those days, the River Welland would have come down towards Peterborough um, and indeed goes near Etting, Maxi, and all the rest of it. So we are learning so much about our Bronze Age ancestors from this one site. And Francis, I know, was particularly excited because when they built the replica Bronze Age house at Flag Fen, the calculations he did for the roof pitch um, were largely based on what he'd excavated. Nobody had ever found uh, intact roof timbers or anything. Well, when they found them at Mus Farm, they were able to do a reconstruct uh, using computer technology it proved that Francis had actually got the angles completely right. So the angle of a, a Bronze Age house is different to an Iron Age house. Um, difference in the thatching that was used meant that the angle had to be different, as I understand it. No real expert on that. The other exciting thing about what the Must Farm team has done is that most, I won't say this, in the past, most archaeologists have gone out, done the digs, and maybe 20 years later you see a report, if you're lucky. There is stuff I know done by Jeffrey Wainwright from the 50s and 60s that still hasn't been published. Um, his notes are all over the place, some of them probably destroyed by now. Um, the Must Farm team have kept engaged with the public all the way along. It's why, as Fenland Archaeology, we were able to go along as, a, as, 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 as visitors and see what they were doing. But they've kept up their dig reports. They've put photographs on their Facebook pages. They've showed us, for instance, pictures of material woven from nettle. Um, so actual bronze material from Bronze Age garments has survived in the sludge at the bottom. That's why Mus Farm is really exciting. Um, I think at the moment they're trying to decide will they just use the museum facilities at Flag Fen and expand that or will there be a separate museum devoted to Mus Farm. I don't have a strong view one way or the other. I suspect in the austere times we're about to face maybe using an existing facility might be the judgment call but we'll see. I can't wait to see some of this stuff. It is just absolutely remarkable. And this is what I want to quote something from Francis here. Um, in the chapter in his book, The Fens on Etten, he starts it by saying, we all love big discoveries. We would not be human if we didn't. People outside archaeology assume that it's all about those moments in a trench when there's a glint of gold or your trowel scrapes the bones of a skeleton. But nine times out of ten, the really exciting finds aren't made on excavations at all. The process of revelation could be far more humdrum, but still just as exciting. And I think for all the exciting things we have seen with our own eyes coming out of the ground at Must Farm, the next ten years is going to be so exciting for what they're able to discover. Um, you can tell I'm a big fan. Down to earth, 
let me show you some of the things we've found at uh, Wisbeach St Mary. I just want to check that I'm uh, okay for time. Yep. Um, so this is two bits of pottery. On the left, the shiny bit is Samian ware, base of a bowl, I would guess, uh, uh, maybe a small bowl. And on the right is a piece of British knockoff. Yep, we were knocking off the Romans at the time. So there was big potteries just outside uh, Peterborough, and there is a form of pottery called neemware, uh, which comes in all different colours, shapes and sizes. I I've got some sherds to show you in a minute. But you can see the quality of that Samian ware that largely comes from Gaul. Um, this is a bone pin. Again, not something you would find in a typical uh, poor farmer's house from the Roman period. It's, uh, it's used to, I'm told, as you can see, I don't know a lot about hair, but I'm told it's used by women to tie up their hair at the back. But it's made of bone and highly polished, an absolutely beautiful object. And we took that out of the ground. It didn't need a lot of cleaning up. And I say that's the other thing about uh, Samian ware, that when that comes out the ground, you just literally brush it with a paintbrush and it comes up like that. This stuff, you have to wash, brush, it's hard work. This is all Samian ware. Uh, sorry, this is all pottery sherds we've brought up at Wisbeach St Mary. That's the Samian ware. This is something called, well, I'll make it easy. It's part of a mortar, as in pestle and mortar. And the little black flecks you can see are baked into the clay so you can grind your herbs and all the rest of it. So we're picking this stuff up out the ground. It was tossed away by whoever owned it. In there also, um, I don't know whether it's in this picture. I don't think it is. But we found some roof tile roman roof tile now the site at wisbeach st mary whilst it was outside of the inundation that went all the way up to wisbeach round about 350 a.d it went underwater and therefore, and we and also dating the pottery puts this pottery round about 250 AD. So Roman roof tile, that's interesting because the British farmers working for the Romans or producing stuff that the Romans were taking, presumably going up through Peterborough, you wouldn't have found them building their houses with bricks and mortar. It would still be the Watland daub of the Iron Age roundhouse, we think. And you don't, apart from post holes, you don't find too much evidence of that. Um, and we think, we think there might have been a more substantial structure there. I'm not going to get carried away. I'm not saying there was a Roman villa in Wisbeach St Mary. It'd be lovely to think there was, but we certainly think there was going to be a bigger structure there. So. As an amateur group, we have to wait. We, we, we can't pay the farmer not to grow his crops. So we normally have something like a four or five week window from September to the beginning of October to dig. But this, this is a piece of Samian ware, but I hope you can all see that there's a fingerprint on it. What Francis was saying about, you know, get all your wow moments when your trowel touches something. This was just a bit of pottery we dug up. Oh, that's nice, bit of Samian ware. We think it is anyway, not sure. Put it in the group over there, label it, take it away. A few weeks later, when it's pouring with rain, we all get together in a shed somewhere, cups of tea, sandwiches, and we start cleaning the stuff. Still no wow moment. Uh, Andy, who's a bit of an expert on Roman pottery, says, oh, yeah, I'll take that, 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 and that. And he put this under very good lighting because he could see there was something there. And there it is, a fingerprint. Now, a fingerprint on a piece of pottery isn't unique. Uh, I recently saw a fingerprint on a piece of Neolithic pottery up in Orkney, so 5,000 years old. 
So the fact this is 2000 years old, huh, commonplace, who cares? But then you start asking questions. Well, how did the fingerprint get there? Is that the potter's fingerprint? Probably not. It's probably the clumsy boy or girl who put all the wet pots on a, a piece of wood to go into the oven, into the kiln. We don't know. But technology is getting better and better. There are people now who say that by measuring the gaps between ridges, you can tell whether it's a, a male or female fingerprint. And you can also tell by size whether it's a, a child or an adult. I'm not sure that brings us um, any closer to knowing more about the Romans in the Fens, because this piece of pottery was almost certainly made on continental Europe, but it was still a big wow moment. And if you're the person who picked it out of the ground, you are going to really feel good about yourselves. Uh, in fact, I think the wow moment for our members who have never dug before is when they pull something out the ground and they say, what's that? And you say, oh, it's a piece of Roman pot. Nobody's seen that for 2000 years. And they go, seriously? Yeah. And, you know, they, they spend the rest of the day walking around with a huge grin on their face. Um, and that's one of the beauties about archaeology. So if we go back to here, I've taken you up to the Romans. Uh, we've got the Saxons in there. We haven't found much in the way of Saxons at the moment. If you go after Saxons, we get into medieval times. And one of our members at Begdale has actually uh, put an extension on his property. It's a fair sized property and has started digging up a lot of um, middle uh, medieval. So probably 15th century, 16th century medieval pottery so we are going to go there and uh, do a bit of digging but we are on a, we, we started looking at a new field at Wisbeach St Mary and up came I mean the two remarkable pieces there bit of Samian top right hand corner and this is the tooth um, either from a fox or a dog not big enough to be a wolf um, but these two bits of pottery are interesting because one of uh, an expert from outside of the Fens who works out of Cambridge University reckons one piece, uh, the smaller piece, is Iron Age, but he reckons this is Bronze Age. And whilst you could imagine somebody having in Roman times a bit of Iron Age pottery still in their property, I mean, I think there's probably some of you watching this have got uh, a couple of plates or a server from Victorian times, maybe 150 years ago. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that an Iron Age pot would be in, on, a, on a settlement that was now managed by the Romans up and, you know, around about 250 AD. But the other piece, if that really is Bronze Age, and it certainly has some of the characteristics of Bronze Age pottery, that means we could have some presence on the new field where we're digging that goes before even the Iron Age. Uh, again, it's going to take us two or three years to find that out. And then we talk about new technology. Um, in one of those earlier slides, I showed you the tooth of a, a fox or a dog. We can do a lot with teeth these days we can take tiny little samples and set, send them off for isotopic analysis, which tells us where the owner of that tooth was born, uh, tells us about what their diet was, what sort of water they were drinking. We can't afford to do that. Fenland archaeology can't afford to do that. Um, I suspect if we found human remains, uh, somebody would get involved and maybe want to do that. But museums across this country have got human remains that have not had any modern um, analysis. And that's quite sad. And in fact, the, uh, the, the in recent years and connected with the work I'm going to be doing on Scottish prisoners, uh, up in Durham, 14 prisoners were found because uh, Durham Cathedral, whilst it existed in Oliver Cromwell's time, wasn't used as a cathedral. They used it as a prisoner of war camp. And if you go there, even today, you can see burn marks up the stone 
where the prisoners were lighting fires to keep themselves warm. Well, when Durham University built an extension, they found 14 skeletons, and those skeletons have been subject to a lot of scientific analysis. But what they've also been done is they've been buried, reburied with all the honour and religious ceremony that would have taken place in those days. So I think probably largely a Presbyterian type service. But I've seen the bones at Welney because modern technology meant that they could 3D laser scan the skeletons and then put them through a 3D printer, having matched the resin colour to the bone colour and produce an exact replica of the skeleton. A little bit heavier than a, than a bone skeleton, but even so, you've got the skeleton there. Um, so you can see the wounds to the head or to the arm or, and it would be nice to think in years to come that the skeletons that are held in all these universities and um, museums, and I think there's a skeleton of a woman we think from Roman times in Wisbeach Museum, it would be nice to think that they could be reburied with dignity and honour and a, a 3D printed replica put there in their place. Fenland archaeology can't afford that type of thing. What we can afford, and I heard somebody on here talking about a drone. Well, here comes jolly old drone. This, this drone cost about a thousand pounds. It's got a very good camera on it. Um, and as of a fortnight, this was taken 18 months ago, but a fortnight ago, I went out with the owner, one of our members, um, and he did a survey of not this field a different field which takes high resolution pictures at different angles and then the software will stitch them all together and give us a 3d picture of the field that we want to dig it should show bumps that we can't see with a naked eye which might guide us to doing some more geophys in a particular area it's well it certainly cutting edge technology for me um tim the guy who's doing it is scratching his head a bit and those of you who know about it and i know there's one or two of you out there that the software always seems to be in advance of the computing power of the machines that we're using and the amount of uh the the quality of the graphics card that he needs and the the amount of computing space he needs is phenomenal to do this. And I think he's into about week two at the moment and still hasn't finished. There's a lot of touching up, but that's something we can afford. A lot of members, a lot of people have got drones. Um, be careful. Tim was telling me that he's now passed all his tests. And the one thing his drone does as it's flying, it's actually sending positional data back to whichever government department controls these licenses. So they know where he flew, how high he flew, and the fact he didn't break any rules, which we welcome, but I suspect a lot of people with drones want a lot more freedom than that. Um, but you can see where this technology might help us getting that overhead view. Um, at the moment, we rely on LIDAR technology done by the environmental agency which does show us some quite interesting things lidar is using lasers and they actually look beneath the surface i saw a really good picture of some bronze age barrows out near the dog and doublet on the way to peterborough um, as you go along the river there on the left that piece of land they're scheduled monuments they're known about you can't see them with the naked eye anymore but the LIDAR image really shows them beautifully. Antiquarians dug them up in the 19th century, so I very much doubt there's anything there. Um, but the LIDAR imagery really does give you a good picture. The other thing that gives us a good picture, and it's why Francis went to dig at Eton in, I always get this wrong. I remember 1976 has been a really hot summer, but apparently 75 was as well. And similarly, a year or so ago when we had a hot summer, that does seem like a long time ago, doesn't it? Um, 
if you can get an aerial shot of the ground and and that's what drones do you suddenly see things under the ground that have been hidden since the last dry spell and there was some aerial photography done in the 70s that showed up this causeway enclosure at Eton. Uh, without that aerial photographer, we probably still wouldn't know about it. Can we afford it? Well, no, we can't. We, we, we can't afford, uh, we can afford a drone, but we can't afford our own geophys equipment. At the moment, we're looking into a better GPS device, which will make field walking a little bit easier. Um, that is really the end for me. I, I think I'm 10 minutes under time, so I apologise for that. I think what I do now is click on stop share and that brings us back. Um, I think Karen was going to have a short break after I finished talking, um, but I am happy to take questions at any time before or after. Do we have a few questions beforehand and then have a break? So maybe a few questions or comments just beforehand, maybe. Yes. Judy's got a hand up there. <laughs> Shall I go now? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Fire yeah. Away. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if, if you or, or anybody here knows. Um, I do know that Scottish prisoners of, of war from Dunbar had this folk belief from Scotland that if you planted holly around your where you lived, maybe even just at the corners or, or surrounded it, it would protect you from witchcraft. And mm. apparently you can still see these EGs, these examples. I'm new to the fens. Um, I just wondered if, if anybody knew of any surviving examples I could take. So you're on. saying that um, that, that holly has now grown into sort of trees and you can you can make out four corners from the trees? Y yes, yeah, I can see you're thinking about this as an archaeologist. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm, just, I'm just, yeah, yeah. Some I'm also sort of... thinking about it as an expert on the highlands, which are absolutely uh -huh. full of folklore. And I will check that one out with a, a colleague at the University of Highlands and Islands who is a bit of an expert on uh, folklore. It's a tricky one because the soldiers at Dunbar came from all over. Uh -huh. And although there were Highlanders there, there were also people from the, what we'd call the mid counties of Scotland. So, um, yeah, the, the Highlanders in those days had very little in common with the people on the borders. Uh, it was two completely different societies. In fact, two completely different languages. Gaelic was spoken in the Highlands and Islands, but people from the islands were even coming down to fight. So this wasn't just the Scots against the English. This was a religious conflict. So um, there could have been different folklore habits come down into the fens. Part of my research will actually be looking into who were the prisoners who came down here? Did they ever make it home? One of the things we know that a lot, 10,000 prisoners, between a 500 and a 1,000 made it to the fens, but many of those at uh, Durham were put on ships to New England as indentured labor, and they never came back. They made lives for themselves in the Americas. And there is actually a prisoner of war society in America where their descendants all get together online at meetings. Um, they seem to have more love and more affinity for Scotland than their ancestors ever did, because we can't even find one example of one of these Scottish prisoners writing home or having somebody write home for them. It was as if they got out there and said, well, this is good. You know, we've been exploited by our landlords and the English. Now we can exploit the land and the people in America. I'm being harsh there. And I've been told when I lecture in America, I'll get shot if I say that. So I've got to be very careful. But it's what we don't know is so galling to me as a historian. And the only way we're go I'm going to find out is one from some of the primary sources held in Ely, but also 
by tapping into some of this family research that's being done. So that that's really helpful because that's something I'll look into now. And I will I'll, tomorrow I will get on to a colleague up at UHI and see what they can tell me. I'd not heard that before. So it keeps witches away. Yes, I, I can try and um, I can try and see if I can find you the, the source I, I got that. That would be fantastic. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if anybody you... does want to get in contact, if you go onto the Fenland, uh, the FenArc website, there's a contact sheet there. Uh, and anything you there will, will go to me or at the end I will give you uh, my email address um, so you know you can feel free to if something occurs to you later on or there's something you think I should know about email me direct and I'll be happy to respond thank you so much I really appreciate oh, that that was really helpful Oh, thank you. Julie, I don't know if it links in to any of the bits that you're mentioning, but I know um, Enid Porter did quite a lot of folklore around the fence, so I don't know if that links into any of those 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 bits that you've mentioned. Now, Caroline, I think you had your hand up. I was just wondering, Bob, if you'd been in contact or maybe even part of the group that was doing a project about the prisoners. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I think they started it. Yeah. It's a bit embarrassing, really, because when you when you put in a doctoral pr proposal, one of the things you have to try and find out is, is somebody else already doing it. And if they're doing it along similar lines, then it's a bit silly, really. Um, there is somebody at Durham University looking into it, but from a slightly different angle to me. But because of COVID, we've all been put on hold because all the drainage records we need to see are held in Ely, mostly held in Ely. Uh, there are also private diaries and that in the National Archives. And of course, we just can't, act, haven't been able to access them. The team from Durham haven't really looked at, well, uh, at uh, the Fens yet, but they did come down and do an exhibition at Welney. And as part of that exhibition, they got, um, they got some funding and a, and a, a theatre group or I don't know what that's right doing. yeah and they called it from Dunbar to Denver snappy title but it was fiction you know um, yeah. somebody pretending to be the poor forlorn woman <laughs> whose husband is down in the fence and she's waiting for him to come home I mean, <laughs> you know it, it sorry yeah. it I'm a historian and I get a bit wound up when people invent things and they become the truth one of the things i don't like about Wisbeach castle is nobody challenges the stories and the myths around it and we have people referring to the dungeons there people who should know better they're not dungeons they're vaults mm. and so they and they don't go back to norman times no i was going to say it was it was a bit of an odd project because mm. i belong to a family history society and they did put out some sort of serious feelers about had anybody got information or from the parish registers you know could you see any links mm. so mm. they did put out quite a lot of feelers to sort of proper groups for original sources and I just wondered if you'd tapped into any of those original sources because they were asking people, you know, did they have links? Did had any families trace their families back yeah. to them? That sort of thing. Uh, and and I'm talking to the Prisoner of War Society in America because they're the ones who have done a lot of that research. However, um, I haven't been able to find anybody yet who has traced their ancestor back to the Fens. No, I couldn't find anybody either. No, in the we don't record. really know what happened to the prisoners. We think that um, those that um, did their five years, three years, whatever it was, found their own way back to Scotland. Well, we should be able to trace that. One of the problems about parish records in the Fens is a heck of a lot of them were destroyed by flooding, by, um, in fairly recent times, by uh, church authorities, local authorities worried about thefts and break-ins, taking them away and nobody to this day knowing where they took them away to, are they destroyed? Mm -hmm. it, it's a pity. The, the people who have done most work on parish records in this country 
as far as I can tell, is the Mormon Church. You know, the Church of Latter-day Saints at Salt Lake City. And their website, I am told by a genealogist, is the first place you go to because they have they have had teams of people for many years delving through the parish records of Britain and tabulating it all. Mm, yeah, I, well, no, I won't agree with you on that, but there okay. you go. <laughs> no, no, well, tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, a lot, a lot of the stuff on their website is what people have told them okay as opposed to what is actually in the parish records but yep. you have to be careful yes i just say there's some uh, interesting questions coming up on the chat here and uh helen is asking me about the report on wisbeach castle uh at the end of this helen um if you email me i'll send you the link or i might be able to send you the report as a pdf I'm not sure which machine it's on, um, but there is just so much out there at the moment. Uh, Helen also says she's working for the Cromwell Museum and is about to study for a master's at Durham and she's heard about the Holly. So that's fantastic. Um, that, that Holly is a really good lead and it does make me wonder whether there is anything can be seen in the ground. Trouble with Holly, as all of you who are gardeners know, it grows so damn quick and tends to get cut down quite quickly as well. Um, but, you know, there might be places there. I, some of those prisoners will have died. There's no doubt about that. Uh, it was a harsh life and they didn't, they didn't, weren't given much to wear. Um, malaria was a big issue in those days in the fens. Uh, it must have been a hellish experience. It was hellish enough today with modern clothing walking out there on the river. So, <laughs> what it must have been like then. Oh, Brian, you've got your hand up there. I'm muting. Right, I'm muting. Yeah, the um, recent uh, uh, study that was done a few years ago that's been referred to about the Scottish prisoners down in this part of the world found that there was a disproportionate number of Scottish surnames in the Meeple area. Um, it is actually on the uh, line of the, the Bedford Rivers. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's a certain number of Macs and Mooks that you can expect in, in an area just by normal population movement. But apparently in Meeple in particular, um, that the, the could be found no other explanation for why there were so many uh, names of Scottish origin in that uh, in that settlement. And of course, Meeple was always bigger in the past. Meeple was the predominant settlement in this area, and Sutton just got its name because it was south of it. Mm. So, so Meeple was the biggie, and Sutton was very much secondary. Well, that's really helpful, Brian. And it's it's gonna take a few hours going through registers and that mm. one of the things uh, we do know right the way through history people change their names as well mm. uh, people adopted other people's religions just because the, the the battles that were fought at Dunbar and Worcester were uh, largely fought on religious grounds it got very complicated and in many times people would turn up and fight not on religious grounds but because they were fighting for their for want of the word their their laird or their overlord or whatever <laughs> sort of very few were up there. um and in order to fit in they may well sort of change their name dropping the mac was a very uh, normal thing to do mm. so that type of research is is difficult and you always hope that somebody's been there before you and done all the hard work so here's hoping fingers crossed hmm. Richard I think you've got your hand up there yes um I think that the project that's been referred to was run by Oxford Archaeology um or maybe by the Jigsaw project so Steve Mack would possibly be able to point you in the the right direction, I think. 
um, yeah. as to what the results were. I um, was aware that they were doing anything. I know Durham were, and still are. Um, I think we're talking about maybe six or seven years ago that there was a project that was um, supposed to be a community project, but I never was never very certain whether it got off the ground or not. I'll, um, uh, I'll, email, I'll email Clemency tomorrow and... Uh, yeah, it would probably be a bit before Clem's time, I think. Okay, well, I've got Steve's email as well, so... Yes, yes surely. Um, talking about uh, the, the general uh, funding and that kind of thing, I mean, I was talking to somebody, I think, a couple of weeks ago. One of the things is to look at the CBA East, which is the Council of British Archaeology in the Eastern Region, yeah. which goes across the counties between Cambridgeshire and Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex and Hertfordshire, do small grants. And one of the ideas of that is to get some professional um, backing if you're looking at a, a bigger project. So, in other words, to actually have a few hundred pounds to pay for a professional's time so that you can actually look at an HLF grant or, or whatever and, and get some, some, uh, some build on some firm foundations. And the other thing, of course, is the Cambridge Antiquarian Society. Um, if you're in Cambridge, I'm not quite certain whether you're in CAMS or whether you're across the border. With speech um, is funny, I, I'm personally, I'm a member of the Cambridge Antiquarian Society. I'm also a member of CBA East and Fenark is a member of CBA East. They don't go into Lincolnshire and Wisbeach, part of Wisbeach is actually in Norfolk. Most yes. of it is in Cambridgeshire, but five minutes up the road from where I live is Lincolnshire. So yes. We do do a bit of work up in Lincolnshire and we do do some work with the, I think, badly named Spalding Gentleman Society. Uh, they've I'm been called not. that since 17 something or other, and they're Something not very bad. happy about changing their name. But they have some splendid resources. One of the best libraries uh, of antiquarian books you could find, old maps and all the rest of it. And one of our members, Dr. Michael Gilbert, is now a leading member there, and they are trying to modernise. Um, so we do have a lot of links with, with Lincolnshire, but of course CBA East doesn't go into Lincolnshire. But I know it's something they want to talk about. Can I ask a question to Bob, please? Yeah. Um, so if I were to find something that I thought could be interesting in a field on a walk, Yeah. Who would I contact if I'm in the Wisbeach area? Um, you, you guys, or would I contact? I mean, we'll, 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 we'll have a look at anything. But, I mean, if you think it, it's something of value, the first stop is the county archaeologist. If you contact Cambridgeshire County Council, each county ha employs a professional archaeologist. And then, de depending what it is, I mean... <laughs> The normal rule is if you find something that looks as if it might be of value, it's best to call somebody out and not move it. Mm -hmm. um, that's not always possible. Um, but certainly make a note of exactly where you've found it. Because it, you find one coin, we could come out and say, oh, that's interesting. That's actually uh, a Roman coin. But if somebody digs around there, they could find a pot full of them. And the, the, the value all of a sudden from one coin, county archaeologists would probably be quite happy for you to keep it. All of a sudden, the site can grow and grow and grow. So the county archaeologist is always the, the, the right person. But locally, uh, we'll always have a look at something first in case somebody's hesitant about going to the county archaeologist. Because a lot of people don't want to make a fool of themselves. They say, oh, we've found this interesting thing and we can look at it and we can start to clean it up a little bit and find that it's a 1950s thruply bit. Um, but only going back to metal detecting, we, we were doing something around the edge of one of the field we dig on and we found a King Charles silver penny. And 
out of nowhere. Um, no idea why it would be there, you know. Uh, we'll never explain that. Um, but the context is such that it was probably dropped by a wild fowler or something like that. Um, but yeah, you can you can never know what that one little find might turn into. So yeah, I, I, you've got my email address, um, or feel free to drop an email, and I, you know, always always willing to to come out and look at stuff. We're, we've been called out to people's houses where they've moved in, and they've they've thought they've found something of interest in the in the back garden, and we, we've gone and had a look. Um, nothing so far, and we certainly haven't found King John's treasure. <laughs> That'd be a good one to find, wouldn't it? <laughs> Oh, Bob, thank you so much for, for coming this evening and talking to us about the archaeology side of and, things. And, it's been and thanks fantastic. for all the leads that I've been given. Yeah, lots of different messages going in the chat and thanks for all of the discussions there. So, so yeah, re really good. Thank you. And thanks for the, some of the tips as well and, and advice there, what, what to do if we find some bits. Thank you. Um, so I guess just looking forward a little bit with regards to stuff going on in the fence. So it seems like the world's starting to open up a little bit now, which is really nice. Um, so, so that's fantastic. So museums are starting to open up, galleries, different things that are going on. Um, so do have a look at your, your, your local places. Check their websites first because a lot of places need to be booked first, um, just so that things are a little bit staggered. Um, so um i think we've got something there in the in the, the, the chat there um so yeah so about the um cromwell museum um and some different lectures going on there so thank you for putting that that post in there it's great feel free to put any other bits in the in the chat there while, while i'm just sort of rounding up if there's anything going on um, obviously a big chat, shout out for as well for Celebrate the Fens. I know some of you here are getting involved with that um, with regards to some sessions. Um, I'll be updating the website tomorrow with regards to things that can be um, booked in advance. So do keep an eye on that. Um, I know Chris has got um, a walk coming up with regards to that as well. So thank you for doing that, Chris. Um, so they're, they're arranging um, a um, the Fenage Trail Walk with regards to Thorny um, in relation to Thorny Museum as well. So that will be um, on there as to how you, how you can book that tomorrow. Um, but other things happen on the Celebrate Friends Day, so heaps of things as well. So um, we've got Crowland Abbey, they've got an open day, Wisbeach Museum, what they call themselves, <laughs> um, sorry, Wisbeach Castle rather, what they call themselves open day um, on, on the day as well. Um, lots of other walks, so King's Lynn, there's a walk there as well. Um, Chatteris have got a little nature walk going on. Um, so there's a few bits and we'll just that. keep adding. Um, for all of June, I will be putting tweets and um, posts out with regards to different things that are going on as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so I do, do get involved for, from that point of view. The other thing on Celebrate the Fens Day that will be happening um, is that we'll be launching the calendar competition. So you might remember we did one last year. I know Conrad joined that, probably a couple of others here as well um, got involved with that one. Um, so there'll be details on there if you wish to send a picture in to get involved with, with the calendar ready for next year. Seems too early to be planning it already, um, but, but it's just one of those things that needs to be planned in, in advance. Um, so if, you, if you've got a photo you want to get involved in, then please do. I've also put in the chat the next um, celebrate, um, the next um, Fen Folks Friday will be the day before the actual Celebrate the Fens Day. Um, so we'll be doing a meetup then. So do book that if you want to join us. Um, just a picture of things that are going on in, in the area and some discussions around that and other things going on. Um, so please do, do book that and, and join us. Um, any other events that I might have missed? Well, as I say, feel free to put it in chat. Or if you want to do a quick shout out, you're very, very welcome. But I think we might have covered most of the bit. I'm going to have to go, so bye everybody. Fine, thank you Bob, thank you. Cheers. Great, lovely. So I think we might have um, looked at all of those bits. So thank you so much for coming. Lovely to see you all again. Um, and yeah, join us, join us next time.